Welcome to Search Talk Live with search engine optimization and marketing experts Robert O'Haver and Caleb McKelvin, powered by the Robert Palmer family of companies. Hey, and welcome back to another episode of Search Talk Live. With me today is my co-host, Caleb McKelvin. Caleb, how's it going? Oh, man, it is going great. Ready for another... There's the applause. I love it. They, <laughs> they love me here. Now, ready for another awesome episode of Search Talk Live as we continue... The month of Moz, Moz month, whatever yes, you want to call it. it is Moz month. Yes, we got <laughs> another great episode, and I'm uh, ready to get after it. Yeah, those of you who are just tuning in for the first time, Search Talk Live, we talk about everything digital. Sur- uh, search engine optimization, search engine marketing. Oh, yeah. Uh, social media, conversion optimization, anything. You we name got something it, for everybody. We talk about it. We try to cover it all, content marketing, you name it. So, anyway, uh, that being said, we are, uh, like we said, it's Moz month. We're talking to all the experts and talent at Moz, giving us their insights in the industry yep. of SEO and content marketing and paid advertising. I mean, Moz runs the gambit on that. Absolutely. So we thought we would talk to these guys and eventually ending it up, ending Moz month with Rand Fishkin. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the so, man, go ahead. Oh, I was about to say, if you really want to, if you want to get some great insight and your questions answered, now is the perfect opportunity to do so. Yeah. You know, if you want to call in, you can do so at 855-722-0006. Slow down. One more time. 855-722-0006. Hit option one and you'll be directed to our main man, Dave, because we got a great guest for you today. Yeah. And we are going to talk some geek today with some, about some SEO. Today, our guest is Russell Jones, principal search scientist at Moz. Uh, Russ, how's it going? It's going great. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, we're glad to have yeah, you, man. <laughs> thanks for joining us. Now, uh, we got, <laughs> no I, I got to ask right off the bat, because it seems like all of you at Moz have these awesome titles. What is Principal Search Scientist? Uh, it, it's actually kind of humorous. When I first started in the industry, I, I began at a company and was the second employee, and we just got to pick our titles. <laughs> and so I immediately, I was like 24 years old, 25 years old, I said, I want to be the chief technology officer. There you and, go. And it, it kind of spiraled from there. But when I came onto Moz, I was originally slated to be, I believe it was principal search product scientist because I'm specifically on the product side of the company. Right. But then I asked that they shorten it and uh, they did to principal search scientist, which I think makes me sound really cool. Yes, it does. <laughs> and as I was joking with you fellas earlier, um, I, I think the the there's a, a little bit of me versus Dr. Pete in terms of the titles now. Right. He, sure, he's a doctor. You know, he gets to be that. Right. But I get to be principal search scientist. So. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's awesome. awesome. Yeah, so today we're going to talk about a little, I mean, I know we talked about this last week, but we're going to go into a different part of it, uh, is keyword research. And uh, Russell, that's one of your expertise, correct? Correct. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I came on to Moz, uh, it was in part because they uh, purchased a software as a service tool that I had created called Serpscape, um, which was a keyword research um, tool. So uh, I, I've got a, a decent bit of history it's not not just with keyword research in general, but with large data sets related to keyword volume. So uh, it's one of the reasons why I came on in the first place. That's the place to be. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, let's get into it. What? Uh, where would you like to start? Well, um, you know, for me, I, I guess I could just jump in to say like a little bit about what my specific area of research has been yeah. for the last uh, six or seven months at Moz, and it admittedly. There's a good deal of just minutia here. In fact, the, the article that I just wrote on Moz's blog is called Sweating the Details because it, it is just kind of grossly detail-oriented. And I was very surprised at this at the beginning. When I joined Moz, I thought that, oh, keyword volume, that's easy. You just go type in your keywords into Google Keyword Suggesting Tool <laughs> and you get it back. In fact, I, I am a co-founder and owner of another tool called GrabWords, which has 100 million U.S keywords in our corpus and it's all google keyword volume it's like we're done this is easy but rand like you know just immediately <laughs> looked at me in a meeting and was just like yeah but do you trust it and i was like uh <laughs> the best we've got <laughs> so it, it it became immediately aware to me that it, at Moz, or at least for this particular product um that 
if it wasn't better than what had been done before, it wasn't worthy of the tool. Right. So I, I you know, was Im- immediately diving into the data and looking at it, and we, we discovered all kinds of really interesting things about Google keyword volume. For example, most people don't realize that uh, there are actually only 84 keyword volume ranges in Google Keyword Planner. So you probably have noticed before that your lists of keywords come back with similar numbers in it. Yeah. But the reality is, is, as you get higher and higher and higher in search, uh, the distance between those numbers gets really high. Like I think um, the keyword baseball is something like 368,000 searches a month. But then the next level up is 450,000. So there's like a 70,000 gap um, but between those two numbers. And while that's not necessarily a bad thing, most people don't recognize it. And when you export your keyword volume data, you can actually see that if you average the previous 12 months together, you don't get the average monthly search. Uh, I think there was an example that I provided in, in one post. I want to say it was football games and baseball scores or something, but both were uh, identified as having the same search volume. I want to say like 301,000, something around there. But if you were to average the last 12 months, according to AdWords, uh, the, the baseball keyword was searched over 10,000 times more often per month than the football keyword. Mm-hmm. And if you looked at Google keyword suggestions, you would assume that they were identical. You could miss out on over 100,000 visitors uh, a year just because you didn't do the work yourself. So there were all kinds of different things that we found that were problematic with uh, Google's keyword volume. So we kind of went back to the drawing board and created our own volume ranges. We mixed in some new data sources, uh, this uh, third-party anonymized clickstream data so that we could get real-time results and, and modulate traffic based on trends. Um, I, I remember that the first time I turned on the real-time traffic mm-hmm. for modifying search volume and the first keyword that came through was fuller house uh the, the <laughs> Full house netflix uh um remake yeah. uh, and it was cool just because this was a keyword that just didn't exist right. a year ago and if you have any other just pre-made corpus of of keywords um chances are that keyword's not in there but we were able to detect it it was um prior to google keyword um Google's keyword tool having added it because Google keyword updates monthly and our system made a prediction based on we're seeing this many visits in our clickstream data and the lowest possible search that we would actually expect in Google keyword volume given this many searches in our clickstream data was I think it was like 10,000 searches a month. So we went ahead and assigned it that 10,000 number even though uh, ad planner hadn't caught up yet. So that's one of the the neat things about the way we do volume is we can actually make predictions in advance before Google uh, keyword actually keyword tool actually catches up. And, Ru- and Russ, is that data is that uh, gone off exact match or is that for a broader match or what? Everything is exact match. Okay. Uh, fortunately, well, we probably could do some broad match work, but it, it is. Uh, Google has made it a little bit more difficult to get uh, broad match data. Um, so right, for, at least for the interim, everything is exact match. Gotcha. Good. Yeah. No, that's that's a good answer. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, being able to predict like that, it's got to provide uh, more opportunity on several levels. And instead of waiting and then seeing how many that eventually they say is going to be searched or how much traffic it's getting, Having that prediction kind of puts you ahead of the uh, ahead of the curve a little bit, and you can kind of plan accordingly and and kind of move forward with it uh, instead of waiting around. That that's definitely the goal. Yeah. And what what we hope is that people will be able to discover terms and phrases that didn't exist. It's one of the reasons on the related side uh, where we make suggestions. We don't just use phrase match. Um, you know, Fuller House, for example. Uh, if you want to rank for TV shows related terms, if you were to type in TV shows in most keyword tools, Fuller House wouldn't come up, even though it's clearly relevant. But because we use uh, several different semantic technologies to find relationships, we would actually turn up Fuller House uh, potentially for TV show related keywords. And so you can actually discover these new phrases, even though they don't match any of the words you've used in the past. Right, right. I mean, one of the coolest things that I, I saw was uh, typing in, I want to say Roger Federer, and then choosing closely related topics. 
And the, the list was uh, um, Djokovic, Nadal, Agassi, just a list of the top tennis players um, you know, from the last decade. And to think that the system could not only figure out uh, that Roger Federer um, was a tennis player, but was that also or was related to tennis, but that was also a tennis player, it was really remarkable. Yeah, uh, you know, because it wasn't returning tennis ball, it wasn't returning Wimbledon, it was returning other players. So that, it, it's pretty remarkable. Uh, that's crazy. Do you think there's been a lot of missed opportunity in that uh, aspect? As far as, you know, uh, where they're having to wait around, they can't really get in front of things like that and kind of have that prediction. Do you think a lot of, especially the ones that are trying to compete, say uh, they're on the smaller scale, a lot of missed opportunity in that aspect? Uh, Absolutely. And this is, you know, very, very true for most small to medium sized businesses. Right. They're just not news producers. Yeah. And because of that, unless you're paying somebody to stay on top of the trends, it's hard to do. And Google Trends, unfortunately, doesn't provide you granular enough uh, information for you able to find that. One of the things we're looking at potentially doing in version 2.0 of Keyword Explorer is allowing you to filter based on keywords that are newly discovered. So keywords that we've just found in the last 30 days. So unfortunately, that's something that isn't currently available in 1.0. Mm-hmm. The keywords are there. They're just not identified uh, you know, based on their recency. Right. Yeah. So, I mean... You can use that data as well as, a, let's say, a content marketer to get an idea of how to prepare your content yeah. by getting those related. You you are you are dead on. Yeah. Uh, and and I'll, I'll you know this is a great opportunity for me to segue to my first love. <laughs> uh, so I, actually, um, the the first blog post. This was the thing that I was most excited about writing uh, with Keyword Explorer was what it meant for doing link prospecting. Yeah. So. When, when I want to write or, or when I want to link build to my site and I'm a mechanic, um, I don't know necessarily what topics to create and what topics to link build for. I know that if I try and write about mechanic and then prospect on the word mechanic, I'm just going to find other mechanics and they're not going to link to me because they're my competitor. Right. If, I, if I type it into a keyword tool that gives me related searches that aren't uh, the keyword itself or aren't phrase matches. So type in mechanic and you come back with something like uh, carburetor or, or um, hybrid. Right. Or something of that sort. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, but these, these related terms, eventually what we can do with these related terms is say, okay, well, these are going to help me find prospects that aren't other mechanics. Yeah. Right. So I can write some, you know, generic content around some of these phrases, then prospect for those as well. And I actually worked with um, Garrett French and the folks over at linkprospector.com and was able to show how if you were to take the top 10 results from Google Keyword Planner versus uh, the closely related um, topics from uh, Google or from Keyword Explorer for Moz, that you get a much cleaner batch of prospects and more prospects uh, for the same amount or for the same cost within Link Prospector. Uh, so it's it's clear that having the right keywords means a lot of things get better, uh, not just your title tags. You know, right, the right. The content, the whole link building, the whole process is built on this targeting method that we call keywords. Yeah, and, and that's one of the most frustrating things, I'm sure, as you know, is trying to find out who you're going to outreach to or what type of content, that linkable content you're going to create. Uh, and, and you see these the generic terms, the usual terms all over the place, and you know they're they're like a dead horse that have been beaten over and over again. When you yeah. can find these specific keywords, you know, kind of get more targeted in what you're trying to do, the opportunities and the ROI is going to increase, uh, you know, uh, ten times because you're getting more targeted. You're understanding that there's more opportunities out there than what you're actually thinking or what the, the what's in your funnel right now. Yeah, and I think that's one of the hardest things for people to realize with link building is that they have to be broader. Yeah. Uh, you, if, if, you're, if you're just prospecting yourself, then you're just going to find people like you, and yeah. those people are your competitors. Right. So you've got to go a little bit outside of that to find the right stuff. Um, you know, One of the classic techniques that we would always use for content marketing was it doesn't matter what industry you're in, chances are if you just add the word safety – at the end of what you do, there are resources out there that want to link to content on your site about it. So yep. you, know, you could 
I mean, you could be a site that sells bikes. You could be a site that sells food. You could be a site that, you know, is on human resources. You could be a site on just about anything, and there's a safety-related topic. Now, you might not be a business that sells safety products. That doesn't mean you can't write about it and then right. reach out to all these other things. So you, you do have to go a little bit outside of your, um, you know, your exact niche if you're going to be able to attract links. Right. Uh, very good point. Uh, we have Russell Jones with us, the principal search scientist on Search Talk Live, here to talk uh, keywords, link building, anything SEO and digital marketing. If you'd like to call into the show, you can do so at 855-722-0006. That is 855-722-0006. And hit option one, and we'll try to get your question on air as quickly as possible. Yes, yeah, so... So Russ, let's let's talk about this for the listeners. Now, the people that are noobs at this and don't do a lot uh-huh. of keyword research, you know what? Do, you don't let's let's say you don't. How am I get this out? <laughs> if you do not, you don't always want to go for the keyword that's got the most traffic. I guess Absolutely. that's what I'm going to say. Yeah, yeah. the The way I would always describe it is, you know, the best return on investment might be building a skyscraper on the Las Vegas strip, but you can't do that without a billion dollars. Right. And so what, what you've got to do is choose uh, opportunities that have, um, you know, a, a lot of traffic, but also have high, um, what we call opportunity and low difficulty and then high value. So uh, this was actually a, a presentation that I, I gave recently and we, I called sort of the ideal or the, the perfect keyword. And the idea is pretty straightforward. You, you take a keyword, you figure out how much traffic it gets, and then you want to know what's called opportunity. And opportunity is what percentage of that traffic actually clicks on organic. So it used to be pretty easy when it was just 10 blue links. It all clicked on organic. Yeah. But now with ads and SERP features and knowledge panel and all that kind of stuff, some keywords, you know, maybe only 10, 20 percent uh, click through. In fact, some keywords, I would say it's close to 0%. So if you do, if you search, for example, for like CNY to USD, which would convert the Chinese yen to the US dollar, uh, almost zero people click through to organic because there's a calculator right there that Google provides. Yeah. So that's opportunity. Um, and you need that opportunity number to get really the true volume. Uh, so if the opportunity is 80%, you can multiply the volume by 80%. And that'll give you the real number. The next thing is difficulty, how competitive it is. That's the exact example of the uh, the skyscraper on the strip. Um, the difficulty for that is just insanely high. So you, you want to pick keywords that have a low difficulty. And then finally would be the value, the return on investment. A lot of times the keywords that have the lowest difficulty have it because – nobody's buying anything when they search it. Yeah. So you know, you'll, you'll often find that keywords where they add the word free to it or cheap um, aren't going to be as competitive yeah. as the keywords that are like buy um, or buy now. So you have to mix all of those together. And Moz does that in a keyword explorer, and we call that final number keyword potential. And you can sort by that. But you can certainly do it yourself uh, in Excel by mixing together a number of sources. I imagine most agencies have some variation of this formula um, that they're already using. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know exactly which sources they're using for it, but it's kind of the, the way you get at the perfect keyword. Yeah, and the other thing I want to point, and you brought it up, is kind of, I want to segue into this, was the fact that you, when you're doing the keyword research, you need to understand the user intent or the searcher yes. intent. Yes, uh, absolutely. If they're looking for reviews or they're looking to buy, you know, or they just looking around for information, you know? Yeah. And th- it's one of the things that we're hoping to be able to get a better uh, grasp on with this clickstream data, because what we can actually do um, is look at particular keywords and determine uh, the likelihood that a person makes a purchase based on whether or not an, a search ends up resulting in a triggering of one of the common conversion scripts uh, and if it does, then we know that that keyword is likely to, uh, you know, produce conversions. It's once again, it's another thing that's hopefully in the future of our keyword tool. But without that data, it's impossible to, you know, accept using your own intuition. Or you can always test it out in AdWords yourself. The the best keyword research tool for proving out your intuitions 
is to run a quick campaign in AdWords exactly. and, and, and see how it goes. Um, you know, as, as much as I, I like to always say that uh, paid search is for cowards, but the reality <laughs> is that it's actually a very, very useful tool, even for SEO. Yeah. I always like to say it's the easy way out. I mean, you just do pay and the organic stuff is the hard stuff. <laughs> Yeah. I've seen I've seen too many people lose their shirt in paid search to call it the easy way out. Of <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, but if that if that keyword's converting, you know, eight ten percent, you know, you got something there. So. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Very good. And then you can play off of those variations as well. So, off of that particular keyword. Yeah. Yep. Plus, so, it's nice to be able to get your traffic the same day. Correct. As opposed to link building and waiting a couple of months. Right. Uh, so kind of, uh, you know, a, a group of our listeners are, they have their own website. They're just trying to get it started. You know, they're just finding their keywords and, and stuff like that. They're using the tool. And, you know, that's something we've talked about and I think has gotten a really good response. But I think the toughest thing in, in this industry is getting the information and then actually applying it or implementing it into your strategy. And so it, it, just from your uh, experience and knowledge, and if you can kind of go, you know, not necessarily step by step, but they get the keywords, what, what's their next as far as uh, implementing their strategy and the keywords that they have found? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. Um, the first thing that I would do is recommend dropping that set of keywords that they want to target into some sort of auditing tool. Uh, I, you know, I, I can speak from experience. I know Moz has one of these, but there are plenty of others out there. But the, the idea is that what this will do is then uh, crawl your site and identify whether or not you already have any pages that either rank for these terms, are close to ranking for these terms, or similar to these terms, et cetera, so that you can determine whether or not you've got assets that are worth using. Um, I know, for example, within Moz will tell you, you're tracking this keyword, but you don't have any pages. Yeah. That that have this keyword in the title or something of that sort. So I, I would go ahead and say that that's probably the first step. Another thing that I would potentially do is take that same set of keywords and look at the top 10 results for them and see if any of them uh, are incredibly uh, easy to rank for. So our difficulty tool will give you an idea um, in its metric of what the low hanging fruit is. But at the same time, you're going to get, you know, let's say, 10% of your keywords come back and they look really easy to rank for. Well, you can also go and figure out which ones you want to do first by just taking a quick look and seeing, for example, does no one in the top 10 have the keyword in their title? I mean, if, if there really is no good on-page optimization for any of those terms, then there's a good opportunity there for you to just create content and rank for it. Right. So at the beginning, I would really start focusing on the long tail unless you have some sort of great linkable asset that's going to allow you to build up. The, the only other thing that I would say, and um, you know, once again, as, as much as it pains me to say it, uh, I would say drop those keywords in AdWords and see how they perform. Uh, at the end of the day, you don't want to waste any money yeah. because the, the efficiency of your dollar determines who wins. This is a competition against you and your competitors. If you put that money into paid search, you can determine which one succeeds and which ones fail, two things happen. Number one, you're going to be able to figure out what to put your money into uh, SEO so you don't waste time and energy on keywords that don't uh, convert. But also, number two, those keywords that convert are going to start bringing in revenue on a monthly basis that you can then siphon back in to uh, organic. Now, we used to call this the rent-to-own strategy. The idea was you start by renting your traffic from Google AdWords, and eventually you keep putting that money back into you know, the equal sum back into paid search, but then whatever profits were made back into organic so that eventually you could rank for those terms and wouldn't have to rent them any longer. Yeah. But that's kind of the long-term sustained approach that allows nearly any business to grow safely. Yeah, yeah and you, you know, a lot of people are going to hate to hear this, but, you know, I have many of clients that actually maintain the paid search and, and rank organically as well. So if you're yeah. making money, yeah. Why not? Exactly. Like, it, it, I've had this problem before where customers will come to me and say, well, you know, we're ranking organic now. Should we stop? And I said, well, <laughs> I can look at your paid search numbers and you're turning $1 into two. And I can look at your organic numbers and you're turning $1 into three. Are you telling me that you don't want to make $2 for everyone <laughs> and $3 for everyone? Right. Like, why? 
you know, if I could walk up to two people and have them both pay me, you know, why would I? <laughs> so the, the real question is whether or not you're ever cannibalizing. And, and that, that tends to be rare. I would say that occurs potentially when you're bidding on your own uh, brand keywords. I, I think, if you already have site links, for example. Yeah, I think now even so more because, you know, Google throwing the fourth ad at the top of the, the serve. So now you're, you're five down before you get to actual organic search, you know? Yep, I, I agree. It's certainly if you're in a highly commercial space um, it is, and where the buyer intent is really high, people click on ads because they want to shop. Right. You know, I, I hate to admit it, but there's there's no reason why you should feel like you have to take this kind of binary approach to it where I'm either going to be all organic or all paid search. Right. Um, you, know, you might as well figure out what makes you money and do any and all of those things. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's, it's what makes sense. I mean, if like you said, if they're you're making money both ways, then why not? Right. Yeah. If it's scalable. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we actually do have uh, a listener did email in and they uh, asked, is is there a different strategy and approach as far as the local business goes? Should you approach it differently and how should that work? Absolutely. Completely differently. Uh, I'll go ahead and start with a quick caveat that I have so much respect for how different local search is to say that I'm not confident that the advice I'm about to give you <laughs> is, is accurate. You really should double check it. Um, but I, I would say that I've, you know, I've certainly competed in a, a ton of different spaces from local to national uh, to international. And it is a completely different market with local. Um, you know, whether it's citations or making sure your Google Places listings are perfect, um, dealing with central to proximity issues like being in close to or a certain issue or place in the, within the city, et cetera. There are just so many different factors, numbers of quality reviews on Yelp or right. Google Places, et cetera. Well, it's not even Google Places, Google My Business, whatever. <laughs> right. um, you know, it, it's a completely different thing such that you know, at, at Moz, we have a completely different product called Moz Local, and there are other great local tools out there as well. Uh, so yes, it is different, and if anyone tells you that their approach is the same for local and national, that's a good red flag that it's time to choose a different provider. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> Throwing up. Yeah, absolutely. If you're just tuning in, you are listening to Search Talk Live. We have our special guest today, Russell Jones, the principal search scientist at Moz. Uh, if you'd like to call in, we're discussing uh, keyword, keyword research, uh, link building, SEO. If you got your questions, call on in at 855-722-0006. That is 855-722-0006. Please hit option one. Uh, Search Talk Live is powered by the Robert Palmer family of companies. You can visit robertpalmercompanies.com, check out everything they have to offer. Uh, I advise you do so. A lot of cool stuff for everybody there. And just to let you guys know, too, this is the month of May as Moz Month. Yes. Uh, and for those of you that think we are not being paid by Moz in any way. No, we just, uh, <laughs> we love, we love those, what those guys are putting down. We're picking up what they're putting down. Yeah, exactly. And, and we use their tools and everything else. Yeah. But if you do want to try out their tools, they have a 30 day trial. I recommend you going and checking out their keyword explorer tool. They just launched Very it. Cool. Was it in a week now? Yes. Two yeah. Uh, two, 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 two weeks. weeks. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I've been all up in that thing and it is, lose, it's lose pretty awesome. Time. Yeah, yeah it, it it definitely came together. I, I was pleased. It's yeah. the, the biggest product launch I've ever been a part of, and man, uh, I, it was uh, yeah, it was a harrowing experience. I'd yeah, say. It, it's extremely easy to use. I mean, for the beginner to the pro, you you won't have a problem using it. If you have trouble, there is Q and A and all that stuff right there support. Uh, but I would def definitely try it out. It's worth its weight in gold. Very you know, good. It, it's unfortunately it's software, so it doesn't weigh anything. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean. <laughs> right. Come yeah. on, Russ. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I I just had uh, my I guess my my six month or my first six month uh, review at Moz, and the first thing and the only complaint they had was you need to cut back on the snark. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just part of my personality. Hey, yeah, yeah. Hey, if that's the only thing, that's good. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. There you go. So uh, now, okay. what do, when you here's another thing for the listeners: when you're when you're doing your keyword research, 
what would be okay you've got a keyword that's got low volume i mean actually a lot of volume or oh hang on let me let me say that again okay you've got a keyword you 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 found but it's only got like 5000 searches a month okay but you know that's spot on you've tested it in adwords the conversion rate is decent what would you recommend would, is that too little yeah. volume or should they? There, there's no such, I would say there's no such thing as too little volume. Uh, although you, you, yeah, that's not true. <laughs> Zero volume is too little. Volume. <laughs> uh, but, but you have to take into account is just whatever your fixed costs are for ranking. Right. So uh, 5,000 searches a month can be in, in incredibly valuable. Um, you know, if yeah, the well. term is, yeah, if it converts well and if the value is um, high enough, I mean, absolutely. You know, I know that, for example, um, I think there are 3,600 or so new mesothelioma cases per year. Uh, the keyword mesothelioma lawyers um, uh, is only searched 480 times a month, but the CPC is 141 bucks a click. Yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> So that. The, that you got to take into account the, the value of that click, um, that, that's, uh, that, that, or at least the value of that visitor. So uh, I, I would say you you got to come up with an approximation of how much value you're going to get out of that. And then at the end of the day, you just say, well, how much does it cost for me to rank to that? If I identify that I need approximately 30 or 40 backlinks and I need to have – uh, you know, content of this quality, how much is it going to cost for me to write this uh, content, how long is it going to take for me to acquire those links, and then relative to the other opportunities, which might be easier to gain quickly, uh, you know, do I go after this? I, I will caution to say that in most cases, uh, businesses underestimate the amount of time that it takes to rank and overestimate their ability to stomach that wait period. So from 10 years being in an agency and telling people on day one, look, you know, we need to get this many links. It's going to take this amount of time. Your competitors are getting links at this pace, so we've got to outpace them, et cetera. Um, are you comfortable with making an investment for this amount of time before you start to recoup? And they say yes, invariably, but what they really just don't seem to get is that until you're sort of ranking near the top of your keyword, your return on investment is zero. So until you actually get there, uh, it's going to be tough. So um, make sure you're comfortable with that before you start going after keywords. If you need to bite off smaller bites that you're going to uh, rank for in a month or two and start recouping that investment, uh, by all means do it. And you know potentially there are 20 keywords that you could rank for within a month as opposed to this one much better keyword that will take you six. Well, can you wait for that other one? seven months as opposed to six and then go ahead and knock out these 20 that are going to um, start building up income for you. you know, that you've got to be careful, but a lot of these are more business decisions really than they yeah. are SEO decisions. What we want to do is put into the hands of businesses all the information that they need to then make that business decision. Right. And um, make the, so set those expectations in the beginning. Oh yeah, absolutely. Expectations are everything in our yeah. industry. Which brings to the other thing you wanted to talk about, doesn't it? <laughs> what, just agency life in general? Well, uh, consulting and, and uh, yeah, this, this was uh, something that it's just really been playing on my mind lately because I've, I've seen a lot of uh, consultancies, um, I guess, struggle historically about how to be successful with tools. Um, and, and, and most importantly, come up with ways to be uh, profitable, not just as an agency, but profitable on behalf of your clients as well, um, in, in a way that is, I, I guess, um, up, up front and uh, straightforward with the customer. And then let, me, let me give you an example. Um, a lot of people are generally opposed to the idea of white labeling products because it, it looks like... Uh, you're taking credit where credit wasn't due. And generally speaking, I would agree with them, except when it, you are straightforward with the customer and, or the client and say, look, you know, as an agency, we 
purchase access to all of these different tools, service providers, data providers, et cetera. And because we buy a larger quantity of them, we get them for cheaper. So, you know, when we were, or when I was at Angular, which was my old firm, um, you know, we had, uh, you know, access to Moz, Majestic, Ahrefs, all, all of the SEM Rush, yeah. all of the main tools out there. And we used them and we generated reports out of those tools and we sold those reports to our customers. Now, the reality is, is that our customers knew that we were doing this, but they also knew that for them to generate that same report would cost them more money in just a single monthly subscription. Right. So it, at the end of the day, it would never make sense for them to go out and buy these tools themselves individually. And so when I was uh, talking to someone who was kind of buying at the, um, the the individual cost of Keyword Explorer, so Keyword Explorer has a yearly subscription right now, unless you're a, um, excuse me, a Moz Pro user, at which point then it's the monthly subscription. But if you just want to buy Keyword Explorer, it's a yearly subscription. And I think the the uh, starter cost is um, six hundred dollars for the entire year. Now that's roughly fifty bucks a month, which puts us right in par with everybody else. But he was a consultant, and I was like, "How how many clients do you have right now?" And he said, "How many clients?" And I was like, "How many of them uh, do keyword research?" And we said, "We do keyword research at the beginning of the year for all of them to plan out the year." It's like, "How much do you charge for that report?" And he told me how much he charged for that report, and I was like, "So you're telling me." that just three of your customers would pay for the year for this tool, and then all of the other customers would just be profit. No single one of those customers would ever want to buy the tool because that would be $400 more than what they're paying you. And you, when, once he started to think about it, he realized tools are sort of like buying inventory for your retail store. Right. So if, if I were a grocery store and I was – putting cans of food on the shelf. I'm looking to buy food in bulk at a cheaper price and then selling at a profit to my customers. Um, and the same thing happens for tools. Is an agency one of the best assets, the best things that you can offer um, your users beyond your knowledge is access to information and tools that they could otherwise not afford. So, uh, and you know, sorry for the rantiness of that kind of no, statement. No, you're good, you're on point. I really want agencies to become more profitable and sustainable. And one of the ways to do that is to stop being so addicted to making money by the hour. And to make money outside of the hour doesn't mean you actually have to build your own software. You can actually rely on other software. And and once you've done that, then you've freed up more hours in the day to do hourly consulting and it ends up being a really help, healthy and productive cycle, um, not only for your business, but also for your clients who are getting the benefit of access to all of these tools and the data that they provide, um, and at the same time getting all of the good consulting that you provide as well. Yeah. Now, uh, me, I started SEO back in 2002. Okay. And back then, I used to do everything old school. I used to pull all this data manually myself. Yeah. Before we even had all these nice, awesome <laughs> all, tools. Yeah, oh. shiny now, tools. Let me tell I you remember, about Unscalable. <laughs> yeah. I, I remember writing scrapers for the, what was it, the Yahoo, uh, um, or what was it, Overture keyboard tool. Yeah. Because um, that, that used to be the, the best keyword tool. Uh, yeah, that was a long time ago. Yeah. In 2002, that meant you were uh, the pre, pre-Florida update, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, I came right in after that. Uh, so I, I stepped into a giant poop storm. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, I mean, the hours that it ate up to pull that data and aggregate it and manipulate it, I mean, it's just, you look at these tools now, it's just like a time saver. I mean, if you look at the cost versus time spent from what I was doing before, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's it's it makes sense, obviously. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's nuts, um, and it, it the the sizes are just insane. Yeah. You know, I the the keyword tool that uh, that I use or that I had created had the keyword volume, just volume for 100 million keywords. The Moz keyword tool has two billion keywords, and that's not that's not even counting the real time crawl that it does of Bing, Yahoo, and Google Suggest, which are essentially as deep as Bing, Yahoo, and Google suggests 
uh, inventories are. So it's just the, I feel like the numbers just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger month after month, um, the, at least the amount of data. So then the new problem is how do you filter that down into something useful? Right. Uh, that, that seems to be the, the problem these days, too much data and not enough, I guess, too much noise and not enough signal. <laughs> You guys need some machine learning stuff going on there too. <laughs> uh, we got a, we got a lot of that going. <laughs> yeah, I would say that um, pretty much every project um, that we do at Moz these days, uh, the first thing we say is, "What is the computationally correct approach to this problem?" So there, you know, I'll give you a, a real quick example. So. We've got these two billion keywords, and obviously we can't get all of the search volume for it. So I sat down and wrote a machine learning algorithm built on what's called gradient boosting, which is a standard um, machine learning technique, and uh, created something that would predict whether or not a keyword would have volume. So you know, we could take these two billion keywords and then whittle it down to a much smaller set of keywords that are likely to have volume and then go get the volume for those because we couldn't brute force check two billion. And that was just to answer the simple question of should we get volume for this keyword or not? And so many more of the the, the bigger processes are managed by machine learning as well these days. Uh, there's just a uh, leaps and bounds above my knowledge, especially coming from folks like Dr. Matt Peters, uh, unfortunately on sabbatical right now, but um, he's the sort of head of data science mm -hmm. at Moz, and the stuff he comes up with is just, uh, I'll, I'll relay a, a quick story. The, um, the first day that I came to work at Moz and visited the Seattle office, mm -hmm. I had, I thought was a brilliant idea. I was going to take all of this correlation study data and build a model for predicting whether or not if you flipped certain switches, like if I dropped my keyword into a title tag and added, um, you know, increased my relevancy for the page by this much, would it allow me to increase in rankings? And so I, I had this whole little plan thing. I, I thought I was brilliant. I was just like, this is great. And so I walk up to, to Dr. Matt, as we call him, and I say, Dr. Matt, let me show you this. What do you think? This is great. And he just looks at me and says, yeah, that's not how you do that. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds awesome, I kinda, though. Uh, yeah. I just kind of shrank back down. He's like, no, no, it's a good idea. It's just there's a much better way to do that. Mm -hmm. And we sat down, and he you know, showed it. It's like, we can use this technique instead and that. And it was like, oh, really? This is great. Uh, so you know, it, it is pretty humbling to sit in front of people who actually uh, have a lot of pedigree. You know, I met... This uh, one of the folks on the team, Aaron Renshaw, who did a lot of the keyword-related stuff. Mm -hmm. um, she was introduced to me uh, by Matt by saying, uh, "Do you remember that so-and-so paper on?" And I can't remember what it was right now, but it, it was a fairly prominent paper that had gotten passed around certain uh, circles in SEO. And I was like, "Yeah, yeah." So it's like, "Yeah, Aaron wrote that." And I was, it was what? <laughs> And then I sat around the the, um, the HR table with all of the new hires, and you know here I am from an agency thinking I'm important, and then everybody just went around introducing themselves and where they're from. It's like this one person says, "I worked at Google, I worked at Amazon, I worked at Lockheed Martin." You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what? Are we, are we building missiles now? Right, right. <laughs> it's it incredible, like just the, the depth of knowledge. Kind of uh, humbles you real quick, huh? Oh, yeah. Well, it takes me about 30 minutes, and then, you know, I get back on Twitter, and I look at my followers, and it's more than theirs, and I'm happy again. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't take too long. Yeah. yeah. All so, right. All right. We actually have a, another question that came in, uh, kind of related to links and link building. Um, to rank for a specific keyword, do your links need to be exact match and keyword specific? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's, there is still no single metric that moves the needle better, as far as I know, than exact match root linking domains. Um, yeah, it, it's just, it, it, the way I used to describe it to all, all my friends who have no idea what search engine optimization is, is if a link is a vote, it's like going to the, 
election board to show up to vote and then saying, I vote for so-and-so, but then not saying what position you're voting for them. Yeah. But, but if you put the keyword in there, then it's like saying, I vote for so-and-so for mayor. And the, the problem with that is that it's, it's really putting your foot out there. Yeah. I was just going to say. That, that makes it easy for Google to detect. So I, I wrote um, a machine learning technique for detecting uh, susceptibility to penguin. And by far the easiest metric, the most predictive metric was anchor text over optimization. I mean, it was just, it's such an obvious red flag that was easy to pick up. Yeah. And, and so it does still matter. It's still probably the single most important factor but it's also the single most important factor in getting penalized. <laughs> so the, the, the way I just try to describe it to people now is that use regular, you know, white hat link bounding techniques to get yourself to the position where you deserve to rank. And only then, if you are not ranking, despite the fact that you can objectively say, I have the best content, I have the best links, I deserve this. Um, only then should you consider saying I need to go out and you know get links with exact match anchor text. Um, and, and even then, you've got to ask yourself, is it worth the risk? Yeah. Moderation. Now, <laughs> yeah, moderation is there. Um, and, and admittedly, you know, there are guys who can probably gonna listen to this thing, uh, friends of mine who are in the black and gray hat community, you know, I cut my teeth on black hat SEO. Um, who are going to be like, nah, you can just go out and get links, whatever. And they're right. But <laughs> what they're interested in doing is churning and burning sites. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they're going to make a ton of money. And, you know, that's true. But if you're, if you have a, I, hate to, I don't want to be pejorative and say this, but if you have a real business in which losing the brand is something that you're concerned about, uh, then you really need to be careful about using exact magic or text. Yeah. It's, it, you know, especially with Penguin somewhere in, 2000 ish <laughs> coming yeah. out, uh, 2016, hopefully. Yeah. Um, you really, really have to be careful because now that's, that's going to be live updates and, and automated and all that good stuff. So you'll know yeah. pretty quick. It'll be, a, it'll be pretty interesting. I, I'm, I'm very concerned about what the potential implications will be relative to negative SEO. Uh, because the the real timeness of it means that people won't have time to, uh, you know, like right now I can monitor my links daily and have the potential to remedy concerns about them prior to the next penguin rolling out. Yeah. Uh, once it becomes real time, that will become much more difficult. Uh, and the the positive of that is that I can fix it, um, you know, potentially faster than before. So you know, there's a give and take here, um, certainly, but at the same time, you know, there's, it'll, it'll make it almost unavoidable, yeah. uh, or make negative SEO almost unavoidable. At least right now it's avoidable as long as you can catch it before the next penguin update. Right. Yeah. So those of you that haven't heard of the disavow tool, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you have to get familiar with it. Unfortunately, that is a, a new reality. Yeah, um, yeah. One of the, the my favorite moments while being in an agency was uh, we had launched this tool called Removem, mm -hmm. which is a removal tool and disavow builder. Uh, and we had kind of gotten this uh, reputation as being a company that could find or help you find people who did negative SEO against you. And we had had a, a couple of uh, successes. Well, we had this really nasty campaign that we were fighting against. Um, people were using uh, anchor text that basically accused the site of the worst possible things. Um, think like instead of the anchor text being like payday loans, think of it being like murderer, except the types of stuff that if you went to prison for, you would be the guy who got beat up in prison all the time. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> it's just like really bad stuff. And we finally tracked down to the hosting company after going through all these different hoops, who was responsible for this? We didn't know a name, but we, we knew it, um, if we could get the hosting company to respond and give us their information, they we would know who it was. And so we sent in this abuse request. Well, unfortunately, with abuse requests, they are forwarded on to the webmaster, and the abuse request has your 
information on it. Um, and I filed the abuse request. The very next day, they had rolled out an extra <laughs> campaign saying that so-and-so company has hired Black Hat SEO Russ Jones to spam the web and oh. sell stuff. Blah, blah, blah. So my name was now all over the web. <laughs> now, so this caught, whatever. So you were and attacked like, by anonymous, huh? <laughs> <laughs> It, you know, in retrospect, it was humorous. And to be honest, like, I, I brought it to Matt Kotz's attention. He was like, yeah, it's already flagged in your account. We know it's fake. We know it's not hurting you. Blah, nice. Blah. So Google, at least the most egregious negative SEO, Google catches it pretty quickly. Uh, okay. Because yeah. it's the exact same filter that tells them to ignore it in the first place. Yeah. You know, because they wouldn't want you to ever rank for it. So why not just ignore it? Um so in that regard, uh, I, I can only give kudos to Google for it. But it, it was sort of uh, a sign of the writing on the wall that um, negative SEO had become not only uh, you know commonplace enough, but people were confident that they could you know come after somebody who had gotten that close and still not get in trouble. Mm. So it is what it is. <laughs> So those of you that are just tuning in, we are on search. We are you are listening to Search Talk Live. I can't talk today. Mm -hmm. um, you can visit Search Talk Live if you're listening to us on iHeartRadio. You can go to searchtalklive.com, listen to previous shows, catch us on Twitter at Search Talk Live. You can go to SoundCloud, Spreaker, we're everywhere. Yeah, we're we're everywhere. <laughs> so uh, listen, we're we're on every Tuesday from three thirty to four thirty. Um, and you're listening with, uh, or listening to us interview with Russ Jones, principal search scientist at Moz. Man, I can't talk today. Ah, man, fumbling and bumbling. <laughs> it's all good. Hey, the day's almost over. Hey, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. We got about uh, eight minutes. Mm -hmm. You want to call into the show? It's eight five five seven two two zero 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 six. Option one. You can ask Russ, our guest, the questions, or you can ask me or Caleb. Uh, yeah, yeah. So. might have an answer for you we'll see <laughs> uh russ one of the questions i like to ask especially our guests that come on the show is we always have to have the the power of foresight it seems like we always have to know what's coming on in the future so is there any kind of things in the works or anything changes that you see right now or uh, trending towards changing uh in the industry that we should be looking into or expect uh, or get ready for anything coming up you know, they're, they're probably, I, I, I'd say two quick tidbits. Um, the, the first was something that came up a couple years back in a conversation I had uh, with, with Matt Cutts, which was uh, why Google hadn't allowed um, webmasters to nofollow links inside of Google Webmaster Tools. So basically, uh, instead of adding nofollow to the URL itself, mm -hmm. just have a list of your outbound links inside of Google Webmaster Tools and no follow them there. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the question obviously being is just that this would be hugely damaging to the, uh, the link selling or manipulative link industry because no one could ever know that the link that they acquired was actually passing value because right. they couldn't get access to their thing. And, and Matt said, um, you're thinking a few years in advance. So I, I don't know if and when that'll happen, but I have every reason to believe that Google is very interested in undermining um, you know, the non-earned link um, as much as possible. Right. And so that leads me to my second thing, which is uh, something that has kind of hit me recently. Um, I, I think a lot of you have probably heard, um, and I, I won't say the last word because we're on air, but uh, Will Reynolds from Sears' famous clip of doing RCS, real company S word. Uh, and the idea <laughs> is that, you know, to do good SEO, um, you should do RCS. You should actually behave like a real company and stop, you know, pretending and uh, always looking for shortcuts, et cetera. Well, I, I think I, it's time that we need to grow that a little bit more. And there's um, the slogan, Essie Quam Videri, it means to be rather than to seem. And it's the slogan of the state where I live, North Carolina. But what I really like about it is that it basically says, um, instead of just trying to make it look like your site is the best, actually be the best. Right. And 
so one of the things I want webmasters to try to focus on the next year or two is um, instead of you know typing in the keyword and looking at their competitor sites and seeing how many more links they have or how better optimized their title tag is, or things of that sort, look at those pages and those sites and see what features do they have, what content do they have, what, what are the things that actually make their site better than yours, and then put yourself in a position where you can objectively say, I have one of, if not the best pages or sites on the internet for this keyword. And that way, you're, you're never in this position, this awkward position where you're trying to justify why your site should rank not based on the quality of the site or the page, but based on the links that you've acquired. Right. And I know that's kind of like feel goody, whatever, but um, being in an agency for a decade and you know dealing with the clients who are on one side saying, we will give you all the money in the world to get us to rank even though we don't deserve it, and the clients who say, we have half that money, but look, our site already deserves it. I will take the latter every single day. Right. Yeah. That site is that site's going to rank better, perform better. They're going to be profitable. You're going to be profitable. Long term relationship. Everything's great. And you know what? The best part about it is, l- let's say you fail. Let's say you don't succeed in getting the rankings you want, but you've actually created a fantastic website. You've then provided an asset to your customers or to your business that. Is useful outside of search. Search isn't the only thing. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I'm really kind of thinking about this um, to be rather than to seem kind of thing for the future, which is, you know, I, I think a, a nice little mantra to follow uh, and, and to be prepared for Penguin or whatever else Google is throwing your way. Yeah. Russ, we're about out of time. I want to give you a special thank you for being on the show. Absolutely. Uh, and thanks to Moz and everybody else for promoting the show and, and their support as well. Um, we uh, definitely, if you want to go check out the Moz Pro Tool, go to moz.com. Check out the tool. You get a 30-day trial. I would definitely recommend that. Yep. And again, uh, thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah, we appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Very so, awesome. I want to give a special shout out uh, to some people. Uh, we are getting super popular in the United Kingdom and Australia. So I want to give a special shout out to the people in Australia and the United Kingdom. Yeah, man. That's uh, pretty huge for the United Kingdom being so small. There's a ton of people listening to us. Yeah. But uh, I want to thank everybody there for their support. Uh, catch us next week on the show. We have uh, another guest from Moz. It's Rand, right? No, no. Rand's on the 31st. We uh-huh. have... Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have it up. Um, give me a second. <laughs> this is terrible. Kelly. I think it's Kelly. It's her first name. Kelly Cooper. Kelly Cooper, yes. yes. We are talking about paid advertising. She's a paid advertising expert at Moz. Yes. We'll have Kelly Cooper next Tuesday, 3.30 Eastern Standard Time. Make sure you tune in live, which you can do so on searchtalklive.com or our the iHeartRadio channel. Uh, you can just go to iHeart and type in search talk and we will show up. Yeah. If you go, you can also go to our website, listen to previous episodes of the shows we have. Yes. Uh, if you, we have pretty much the who's who of, of Man. influence on our, everybody <laughs> of interviews here. Yes. It's and now, we can add, now we can add Russell Jones to that one. Absolutely. Uh, Russ, thanks a lot. We'll send out the show on Twitter and all the social media after the show's over. So you can listen to it. If you missed some of it, um, Thanks again, everybody. We'll see you next week. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Search Talk Live is a presentation of the Robert Palmer family of companies.